Thank you, Yuri, and thank all of you for coming to hear what my lab does in our corner of Cherry Emerson. Um, and I apologize for the kind of goofy title, but I hope you'll get sort of the pun and the story as I go along. Um, all the work I'm going to tell you about today is the result of some fabulous undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs who I convinced to join me on this adventure when I arrived in 2008. In my lab, I can't dim the lights, I was told. Well, then they all go down. I'd love to dim the lights. Yuri, can you figure that out if we can dim them? So, all of us in our lab, that's good. What we're obsessed with is defining molecular mechanisms that allow individual bacteria to convert extracellular chemical information into changes in the expression of genes that control behaviors important for bacteria to thrive in a variety of niches they encounter. The bacterium that we focus on is the pathogen Vibrio cholera, the causative agent of the fatal diarrheal disease cholera. You might most likely heard about it because it is raging now in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. Vibrio cholera is a nasty pathogen, causes this fatal diarrheal disease, and typically occurs in populations where there's a lot, of a lot of people crowded together under conditions where they lack access to adequate sanitation facilities and infrastructure. Uh, for example, in Haiti after the earthquake. So in those conditions, humans are forced to consume contaminated food or water. This bacterium gains access to the small intestine. It produces Biofilms that allow it to stick to the intestine, it produces a nasty toxin, the cholera toxin. It gains access to your intestinal cells, and they end up copiously secreting ions into the lumen of the intestine. The end result is massive watery diarrhea, or rice water diarrhea, up to 40 liters in a day. 40 liters. So, people who um, are fortunate enough to receive medical treatment and are placed on these cholera cots, Physicians can monitor the volume of rice water stool and the electrolytes. And cholera is a self-limiting pathogen, which means that if we simply provide oral rehydration for patients, they survive. And the bacterium clears itself, and we've kept them alive simply with Gatorade. Of course, that's a challenge in places like Haiti. Of course, if this rice water um, ends up in, back in aquatic environments, um, cholera actually is a common inhabitant of aquatic systems. As a free-living bacterium, and also in association with surfaces, in particular surfaces composed of chitin, like crab shells and zooplankton molds. And attachment to those surfaces is thought to provide a benefit to the bacterium because it facilitates transmission into a new host. So this cycle can repeat itself over and over again. Um, I'm going to tell you now the story uh, that starts with another Vibrio, a non-pathogenic Vibrio that many of you probably heard of. And this is Vibrio fisheri, maybe equally famous to cholera, or cholera is infamous, I guess. Vibrio fisheri is a bioluminescent symbiont, symbiont of the bobtail squid that feeds at night in Hawaii. So the bacteria actually colonize uh, a light organ on the ventral surface of the squid. So when the bacteria reach high enough populations at night when they're feeding, they don't cast a silhouette. The bacteria provide counter-illumination and this is thought to allow the squid to avoid predation. So it's a symbiotic relationship. When the squid is about to burrow down into the sand and hide out during the day, right before it burrows down, it expels via a pump 99% of that culture in that light organ, and the remaining bacteria stop glowing in the dark. And throughout the day, they're doubling, doubling, doubling in that culture, in that light organ. And evolution has timed this beautifully so that when the squid emerges at night to eat, one billion bacteria synchronously glow in the dark on its belly. So, scientists, of course, who discovered this, like Woody Hastings at Harvard, were fascinated by how in the world this works. And people like Mike Silverman and others defined the genetics of how that actually functions. And I'm showing it to you here in this cartoon. Vibrio fisheri, at low cell densities like I'm depicting here, when there's not a lot of bacteria, produce a small amount of this autoinducer signal, this extracellular signal in red here, which you can think of like a hormone. So when bacterial concentrations are low, either in a flask or in a light organ, the autoinducer concentration is low, and it can't make its way to this receptor, which remains unbound, and I depict in black. And so luciferase genes, light genes, are not turned on. When the bacteria reach high cell densities, there's a lot of that autoinducer signal. It passes freely through the membrane and binds to its receptor, in this case cytoplasmic, 
There's a conformational change, so I depict it in white, which reveals a DNA binding domain. And that complex of that signal and receptor land on the promoter of the luciferase genes and all of the bacteria in the culture bioluminesce. So, since I'm um, at Georgia Tech and I'm in an engineering school, when I arrived, there were lots of opportunities for collaborations. Some of those might have involved being able to make like an Iron Man suit, I hear, but instead what I did was I facilitated a collaboration with some electrical engineers and a biomedical engineer to explore how we might be able to use such a system um, as a communication, uh, a synthetic communication system. So my uh, postdoc, Patrick Bardil, what he did is he took the genes for producing the signal out of fisher eye and the gene for the receptor and genetically engineered E. coli to carry these. And in fact, he made sender cells and receiver cells, neither of which could glow in the dark on their own. He also, in the receiver cell, engineered them so instead of bioluminescing, they produce green fluorescent protein, which is useful because you can use that to observe the bacteria under fluorescence microscopy conditions. And so with the uh, help of Craig Forrest, who's our colleague in BME, he engineered this microfluidic device to grow the bacteria, essentially in this little trapping chamber with liquid flowing by the media and he put this um, microfluidic device on a heated stage of a fluorescence microscope. And we can visualize fluorescence from individual bacteria when we provide or deny them autoinducers that we sprinkle in. We can also, and we're developing systems now where instead of sprinkling them in from the outside, we have a population of sender cells that delivers the autoinducer downstream. And so I'm just going to give you one example of the kind of data we generate with our uh, engineering colleagues. So this is an experiment over five days or something. We've done them up to at least five days. We're monitoring the fluorescence of that population in that chamber. And we're measuring relative fluorescence. And we're providing them with a set concentration of autoinducers for discrete amounts of time. So we can actually um, add autoinducers and then turn off the spigot and shut it off. So we can provide them autoinducers, deny it, provide it again at a shorter amount of time. And we're measuring actually the um, amplitude of that response, the height of the response, and then how quickly we can jam in to a set amount of time transfers of, of information, so bits of information over time. And the idea is that we can use this to develop synthetic systems and perhaps better biosensors by synthetically constructing um, signaling pathways. Patrick's now adding in some more complex features of the regulation, because as I told you in Fisher Eye, it's basically about producing a signal and responding. You'll see in Vibrio Cholera, which will be um, what the rest of the talk is about, the architecture of that signaling system is certainly more complex and we think interesting. So this is the Vibrio Cholera quorum sensing system. So this is the pathogenic cousin of that glow-in-the-dark bacterium. Similar consequence, which is it's regulating gene expression in response to population density. So in Vibrio Cholera, it produces two autoinducers. Autoinducer 1 and autoinducer 2. At low cell densities again, the receptors are unbound. They sit in the membrane. And I've depicted them again in black. These receptors are histidine kinases, which we all learn about in cell biology, which means these proteins can donate a phosphate from ATP and deliver it to another protein, which in this case is Lux U. Lux U donates it to Lux O. And now Lux O in the phosphorylated form can do work. It actually can land on DNA and turn on the expression of four non-coding small RNAs, the QRRs, or quorum regulatory RNAs, that will be the focus of the first half of the talk. Um, based on genetic studies, so this pathway here, of these uh, factors and arrows, is about 10 years of work from the Basta lab, where I did my postdoc. And genetic evidence from that lab supported the model that these small RNAs participate with this RNA binding protein, HFQ, that Roger Wartell in our department studies, and that these small RNAs in participation with HFQ turn off expression of HAPR. They shut it off, so I'm depicting it in gray here. The consequence is that biofilm genes, like the VPS genes, are turned on at low density, and this AFA gene controlling the toxin is also turned on. So I'll direct you over here because we're going to see this a lot. The idea here being that you can turn off a repressor, right? You can remove the break and a gene comes on. So A might, for example, indirectly result in accumulation of Z. In this case, the small RNAs result in production of biofilms and viriums via shutting off a repressor. Okay, so it's a switch. You'll see now at high cell density, 
everything's reversed. So at high cell density, a lot of bacteria, the ligands bind to their receptors and change their conformation from behaving like kinases to behaving like phosphatases, which means they suck phosphate out of the system. The end result is that Luxo is no longer active and it can't turn on the small RNAs anymore. So they're in gray. The end result is that HAPR is produced and these things are turned off. And in the Bastler lab, we proposed a model, myself and others, that perhaps Vibrio cholera, when um, residing in the small intestine, is using quorum sensing then to trigger and facilitate release. So when it reaches high cell density, it shuts off biofilm attachment factors and the toxin, and that allows the body to clear it more readily so that the bacterium can be released from into the environment to find a new host. So for cholera, the goal of getting in your intestine is to make two of itself, two, four, eight, sixteen. When it gets to high densities, it's time to go. So when I joined Georgia Tech, the first grant I received from NSF was to study how in the world these small RNAs work. And Elsa uh, Zhao joined my lab, my first graduate student, and she thought that would be fun to tackle. So she focused on how it is these small RNAs can turn off this protein HAPR. So she read the literature, and most of the work on small RNAs at the time was in E. coli. And this is based on the work of Susan Gottesman at the NIH and others who showed in E. coli that small RNAs typically work like this. They're non-coding RNAs, right? They don't encode for protein. They work by pairing with an mRNA target, like microRNAs in eukaryotic systems. So the small RNA is produced, it folds into some structure, but it has a region here in green that can land on and base pair with the ribosome binding site of its target. And when it does that, it forms a duplex, and so ribosomes can't access the ribosome binding site. So no protein is made. However, when the small RNA is, are, is absent, the ribosomes bind and you get protein. So by analogy in our system, then at low cell densities, when phosphate's flowing down our system, we make the small RNAs. With HFQ's help, they're pairing with HAPR's message, preventing translation, and that's why we predicted at high cell densities, in the absence of the small RNAs, you get HAPR protein. So I also wanted to test this experimentally. So we're going to zoom in now to this level here, higher resolution. So by computational methods, we can predict how the small RNA is thought to fold on itself. So that's the top. This is a secondary structure prediction of this approximately 100 um, base pair small RNA. I'm showing you in green here a 21 nucleotide sequence that is absolutely 100% conserved in all Vibrios that have been sequenced. So now we have hundreds of examples of Vibrios that have been sequenced. They all have a pathway like I showed you. They all have small RNAs, and all of them have this sequence 100% conserved. This is the target HAPR predicted to be pairing with this, and you'll see the ribosome binding site in red. And ELSA uses additional computational tools like target RNA to predict the interaction. And so this is the interaction predicted. Again, that 21 nucleotide region, which we'll think of as the business end of the small RNA, is predicted to pair right over the RBS. And you'll see that it, as common for small RNAs, there's kind of mismatches occasionally. And this is thought then to prevent HAPR from being made. So to test that, she did single nucleotide mutagenesis experiments that I'm going to show you about. And she focused on this region where it's thought to overlap the RBS. So, she made one plasmid that carries a small RNA, so you can turn it on and off, and another plasmid that had a HAPR GFP translational fusion, which means she can measure whether HAPR is being produced by simply quantifying fluorescence. And she put all this in E. coli, which we treated like a test tube. Sorry, Roger. Um, so when HAPR is the only thing in E. coli, we get maximal fluorescence expression. When you add in the small RNA, you get repression. It goes down, as predicted. It's landing on that RBS. If we make a mutation here, which shouldn't affect pairing because it's, whoops, because, God, I always do that, because um, it's not predicted to be involved in pairing, we see that it still works. However, a mutation right here, which was predicted to be catastrophic for the interaction computationally, screws up repression. It's as if no small RNA is present at all. We can make the corresponding mutation just on half our side, no repression, and importantly, when we put both mutations together, and this is the gold standard for small RNA interactions in E. coli, what you see is you restore the interaction. So effectively, we replaced a CG pair with a GC pair. So I want you to remember, too, this pattern of 
this pattern for this graph, which is essentially a frown. When pairing's productive, then you lose it, and then you get it again. That makes sense in E. coli. She took all these results and then moved them into cholera and put these mutations on the chromosome, which was not a trivial task. And then she was measuring readout of these targets. So remember, now we're repressing a repressor. So instead of looking at this interaction like in E. coli, we're looking at the output here. So when the small RNAs work, these genes should come on. And so indeed we see that. We see the opposite pattern, which is a smile. So when the small RNAs are working together, we get maximal expression of this AFA regulator of the toxin. We lose it, we lose it, we gain it back. And we see the same pattern for cholera toxin production itself, that nasty toxin. She looked at biofilms, and again, the same pattern. There's the smile. There's a biofilm at the air broth interface in tubes three and tubes six. So Patrick in the lab decided um, he would jump into this project too and do some in vitro analysis. So literally look at the interaction of those RNAs in a tube. So with Roger's help and his student Taylor, Patrick, um, he he purified Vibrio cholera's HFQ and he in vitro transcribed the QRR RNA and HAPR RNA and added them together in a test tube. And what we see is this. We radio label the small RNA so you can see it on a gel. And when HFQ in the small RNA is present, it runs down the gel to this spot. When he adds in it the target, which is unlabeled, he sees a shift up here. Consistent with the idea that those things formed a, a duplex and it runs more slowly through the gel and only makes it this far. When he makes a mutation on one side or the other, no association. The two mutations together restores the interaction. So in vitro, these results are entirely consistent with the results I showed you in cholera and in E. coli, that the way these small RNAs are work is by pairing with this half bar target and preventing it from being translated. So we published that work, and then Elsa had to do another half of her thesis. And so she thought it would be fun to tackle this other observation I had made, which is in the Bastard lab as a postdoc, I had done a genetic screen which indicated that those small RNAs could not only turn this gene off, but turn this gene on. Hmm. How does that work? How is it that a small RNA can do two different things? And she thought this would be fun to work on. Two and a half years later, that paper should be out in a week or two, after a year of troubleshooting, she got some interesting results. Our experiments take a long time. So I'm going to show you her data from this paper. She went back to the E. coli literature again, and rarely there are small RNAs that do a slightly different mechanism. The small RNAs, in this case, do base pair with their target via HFQ, but they pair in a region that doesn't overlap the RBS, and this allows translation. Now when the small RNA is absent, what is predicted is that the target itself folds back and creates an inhibitory structure that prevents ribosomal access. So in this way, the small RNA, when present, is turning the gene on. And by analogy, then, in our system, we imagine this is our small RNA and its target in both cases. So again, here are the predictions. The same small RNA, the same 21 nucleotide sequence. Predicted, though, by algorithms, we see this inhibitory structure, just like I told you, right near the RBS. But the predicted interaction actually is upstream of the RBS and is essentially pairing with the left-hand side of this inhibitory structure. So our model was then, upon pairing, it essentially <clears throat> flattens out that inhibitory structure, and now the, R the RBS can be occupied by the ribosome. So in this case, the small RNA is promoting translation. So she tested that by the same tricks, and you'll see the results here. This is a Western blot. Again, now she's doing this in E. coli. Now, when only the small RNA is present, that's the only time you get production of the protein. It's a positive regulator of <clears throat> this particular target. You lose it when you make a mutation on one side or the other, and you get it back when both mutations are present. This target, VCA0939, I don't have time to tell you, it's like a whole lecture in and of itself, is a diguanolate cyclase enzyme. And what these things do in bacteria is they take two GTPs, stick them together, and produce this intracellular second messenger called cyclic IGMP, which is all the rage in microbiology now. Because in tons of bacteria, what has been shown is that when cyclic IGMP levels are high, bacteria stick. When they're low, 
they release from a surface and swim away. So cyclic IgMP is thought to be a switch for sticking or swimming. So the prediction was then, if in fact this interaction allows production of this protein, we should see high levels of cyclic IgMP and biofilm formation. Because in this case, it's a factor positively affecting another regulator, right? The, the net consequence is the same. You either shut off a break or you turn on an activator. In this case, the small RNA we predict is turning on an activator of biofilms. So what she saw is in fact that. So we collaborate with um, Chris Waters, a friend of mine at Michigan State, and his student Ben. They quantify cyclic IgMP by LC-MSMS. And we can see that when the protein is produced in cholera, we have higher levels of that intracellular messenger. We lose it, we get it back, and we see that for biofilms too. So again, there's the biofilm at the air broth interface in tubes three and six. So Patrick then was gracious enough to show Elsa how to do the in vitro stuff herself, which took her a little bit of time. And I'll show you those results. They look a little bit different, but they convey the same results that I showed you before. So this is again a gel shift assay. When the radio labeled small RNA is thrown in the tube with HFQ, it shifts once because HFQ is a chaperone. When you add in the target, you get this super shift up to this complex, consistent with a complex that has the RNAs interacting with each other. You use, lose the complex with one, a mutation on one side or the other, and you restore it again. And we noted in our discussion that this complex looks perhaps a little bit different. It's shifting. And we think that might be due to the fact that structural predictions of RNA are notoriously not terribly reliable. Secondary structures are at best OK. RNAs likely adopt tertiary conformations that those programs don't even get close to understanding. So we think that there's probably more complex regulation here than we can visualize. All right, so this is Elsa's thesis right here. These two um, mechanisms for small RNA-based control. And after she joined the lab, a couple weeks later, Elena Antonova joined the lab, and I put her on a rotation project where she simply made another plasmid, which instead of being a fusion of luciferase to this promoter, or this promoter, she fused it to this gene, the promoter for COMEA, a gene involved in DNA uptake. And what we observed is that when quorum sensing shuts these genes off via this pathway, it turns this one on. And so that's going to be the second half of the talk now. So first I'm going to tell you about DNA uptake in bacteria. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to get rid of that details up here to focus on this part of the path. So DNA uptake in bacteria. Many bacteria take up extracellular DNA from their environment, and they do that by building this complex machine. So it spans the inner and outer membrane. Through this blue uh, outer membrane transporter, double-stranded DNA is taken up into the cell. This green part here acts as a piston that extends and grabs the DNA. Double-stranded DNA enters the periplasm. It's bound by this DNA binding protein. One strand gets degraded. The other strand, the single strand, enters into the cytoplasm. Once in the cytoplasm, bacteria can chew that up and use it for food when they're starved. They might use it for repair of DNA, like Francesca Storici studies. DNA repair and use it as a template to span a gap. But the other and, and um, most sort of sexy interpretation of why bacteria take up DNA is because if that sequence is of sufficient identity to get a recombination event, you have now horizontally acquired a new piece of DNA and new genetic material that may allow you to do new tricks. For example, if that DNA encodes an interesting virulence factor or a toxin, you've got new features, you've got new behavior. Importantly, why we got interested in this is because all of the parts of this machine are controlled by quorum sensing. And shown by Gary Skulnick in 2004, like my favorite paper ever, is that this pathway is controlled when cholera sticks to chitin. Remember I told you that cholera loves sticking to chitinous surfaces? It turns out there are 10 to the 11th metric tons of chitin produced annually in aquatic spheres. That's a lot of chitin. Second only to cellulose worldwide. All the Vibrios have figured out how to eat chitin, which is just a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine. I tell my students, that's a pretty good gig. If you can figure out how to eat a shell, and you live in the ocean, you're doing pretty good. The Vibrios can eat chitin, and what Gary Skolnick showed by microarray, 
is that on the presence of chitin, cholera upregulates the chitinase genes to eat it and upregulates all the components of that DNA uptake apparatus, which was pretty awesome because for about 50 years, people have been trying to figure out whether cholera can take up extracellular DNA we give it. And sure enough, if you grow them on chitin, they will take up DNA. And the reason is because in the presence of chitin, it binds to a chitin binding protein, which activates this histidine kinase, just like these guys. Through steps unknown, we get production of a small RNA. You hear the same characters over and over again. This is one of those positive acting kinds, so with HFQ's help, it makes TFOX. So I don't need you to memorize all that crazy stuff. The point is, when chitin is present, you make TFOX. When autoinducers are present, you make HAPR. And both of those are required for DNA uptake. Notice I depicted down here that these are indirect steps, pathways where we don't know the connections. And for some reason, my lab is fascinated with building models where we have lots of arrows and stuff. That seems to be what we like to do. So Elena's idea was to identify some of the factors that might connect each of these to those genes. Because neither of those factors was shown to directly bind to the promoter of any of the components of that apparatus. So the way she hunted for him was this way. She built a strain that was constitutively producing TFOX and HAPR. Genetically, she engineered them. So we didn't have to worry about growing them on chitin. We didn't even have to worry about autoinducers. None of this up here really mattered because these things were being cranked out independent of that. With her Kamiye luciferase fusion, those cells are bright because this gene is on. Okay? What she did is performed a transposon mutagenesis. So she took that strain I told you that was bright. She performed a mutagenesis and plated it out. And with a colony picking robot we had, she picked 30,000 colonies, arrayed them into microtiter plates. And with a machine we have in the lab, a plate reader, she looked for rare dark wells, like this guy, indicating that she had disrupted something in the pathway independent of the two um, systems we had described already. So here's her results. We're looking at Kamiye luciferase expression. Here are the controls. And here is the strain, this third bar, where it's constitutively making TFOX and HAPR. Here's our transposon mutant that is dark, this guy here. She identifies the location of that transposon, and it's in this gene called CITR. So she deletes it. It has the same phenotype. She puts that deletion in various backgrounds. It behaves. And as geneticists, we do the job of complementing. So we put CITR back on the chromosome and show that we restore the phenotype. And then she looked at transformation. So like I told you, we literally grow cholera on crab shells. So my son Charlie and I, we love blue crab. So we go to the farmer's market in the cab. We gorge ourselves on blue crab. I rip off the carapace. And when I bring it in, Erin loves the fact that I brought her my waist from dinner last night. Mm -hmm. She cuts it into little pieces. They autoclave them, put it in sterile artificial seawater and we grow cholera on the surface of a crab shell. And the experiment is to give them genomic DNA marked with an antibiotic resistance gene. We sprinkle it on top, we wait a day, magic. They transform, that's what it's called. And we can count the number of colonies that are now canamycin resistant over the total and get a transformation frequency. And you'll see that the pattern there follows the top. So CITAR is a positive regulator of transformation and DNA uptake. So what she showed here is that it not only positively regulates Kamiye, so you'll notice when we delete it, expression goes down. But we see the same pattern for the pillin, which is that piston. So our new regulator was controlling multiple members of that apparatus. And then she did a, a control, which we knew would work, based on it work in E. coli for CITAR. And this gene we expected to be upregulated, which it is, because while CITAR is acting as a positive regulator of these genes, it works as a negative regulator of this gene UDP, which is involved in scavenging nucleosides. So we'll get into that biology now. And the reason I say this is indirect, you'll see coming up, is that CITAR was thought to do one thing, which is turn off genes. And now we, we knew in our system that CITAR looked like it was required to positively turn on DNA uptake. So, and I hope you can see that in the back. Um, so this is the model that we proposed based on work in E. coli, where CITAR was studied for about 20 years by all these gurus of E. coli genetics. And our model was that 
Just like in E. coli, we showed that site R is turning off UDP, like I told you, and that site R has this consequence where it turns the DNA uptake genes on. So in E. coli, the way this works is the following. Site R is this interesting regulator that behaves with this CRP protein. So if you guys remember back to intro bio, when bacteria are starved, they don't have glucose, for example, they turn on genes to utilize things like lactose. The way they do that is because when glucose is low, CRP binds to promoters and says, polymerase, come on over here and turn on the lac operon so we can eat this other carbon source. We're starving. We need to eat something else. There is a small set of promoters in E. coli that have two CRP binding sites. They're positioned exactly 52 to 53 nucleotides apart. The model that was shown in E. coli is the following. <clears throat> There's this small class of promoters where site R nuzzles itself right between these two CRP dimers. And via protein-protein interactions shown here, it prevents recruitment of RNA polymerase. Okay? So I'll take you through again, which is for genes like UDP, when site R is present, the UDP gene is turned off because you can't recruit polymerase. When you delete site R, polymerase can be recruited, and now the gene gets turned on. And here's the reason why site R is named as such. It is the cytidine repressor. So cytidine is just little nucleosides, little bits of DNA. When E. coli is starving, I mean starving, it will eat anything, even little pieces of DNA. And the way it does that is cytidine or other nucleosides can enter the cell. And what was shown is that when cytidine enters the cell, it lands on this site R. There's a conformational change. Think of LAC I, if you guys are familiar with the LAC repressor. Cytidine binds site R and it falls off the DNA. So when you are starved in E. coli and you smell a little cytidine, you then crank up all the genes for scavenging cytidine, right? I smell cytidine. I'm starving. I'm going to eat it. All of that worked in cholera. <clears throat> but our model was then that site R, again, as I just told you, is an anti-activator. It prevents activation by polymerase, okay? It's just a fancy way of saying it's a repressor. Site R always works as a repressor. We saw that it had a positive effect on DNA. So our model is that, yes, it's a repressor of some factor we need to find called X, which then represses Kami A. So the way it's working is repressing a break. Okay, that was our model consistent with E. coli. So Erin in the lab did the following experiment. She observed that, hey, when you add cytidine to E. coli, UDP is made, and what she predicted then is, in our experiments, when we add cytidine, we would predict that Kami A expression, or DNA uptake, should halt. When they smell little pieces of DNA, the model was, they would stop building that giant apparatus to take up double-stranded DNA. And indeed, that's what she saw. So now we're looking at competence expression here in our wild-type strain. When you add cytidine, just sprinkle it in from the outside, you stop expressing the gene, and you look just like a site R deletion. Because look at our model here. When cytidine is added, it falls off the DNA. That looks just like a strain that doesn't have site R at all, exactly as predicted. And in E. coli, when you make this particular amino acid substitution in that red protein, you become insensitive to cytidine. So there's a conformational change that prevents cytidine binding and you become cytidine blind, and that's what you saw here as well. So instead of a 10,000-fold drop, when you add cytidine to this mutant, you get about a 50-fold drop. So even though they're smelling little nucleosides, they continue to take up double-stranded DNA. And we see transformation follows the same pattern. So then our model got a little more complex, which is that cholera takes up DNA from the environment in response to a variety of extracellular signals. Quorum sensing, like I told you, it has to be um, surrounded by chitin, and it also has to have low abundance of cytidine and nucleosides. So remember I told you there are two or three reasons why bacteria take up DNA. Our models suggest that, yes, cholera can take up DNA 
like a CAN resistance gene and incorporate it onto its chromosome. But it also may be using that DNA to eat it. Because when we provide it with little bits and pieces of DNA, it stops building that apparatus. As if, if you are hand fed little pieces of food, why go to the trouble of building this complex apparatus to pull in double stranded DNA? Okay, so this, all this work was done in my lab in this clinical reference strain C6706 that all of us use, that Vassar Lab uses. It's kind of a domesticated lab strain. We don't do a whole lot of field work. So if you're in like Mark Hayes' lab, you get to go to Fiji and swim in the reefs, yada, yada, whatever. <laughs> what we do is we walk about 30 feet to my freezer. We take out bacteria, we streak them out, we build pathways with arrows, and my students love this. <laughs> but I want to remind you that cholera is a nasty, nasty pathogen, and it is found in the environment. And so we were lucky enough to collaborate with um, folks over at the CDC, Cheryl Tarr, and Lee Katz, who's a graduate of our department, who have gone to Haiti and collected strains where Haiti is ravaging that country. So the reminder from our CDC colleagues was, this is where cholera lives, right? This is where the disease happens. People living in conditions where they're forced to consume contaminated water. The story of cholera in Haiti is a remarkable story of epidemiology. There was no cholera in Haiti ever recorded prior to 2010. None. The earthquake happens, and I'm going to show you a figure recounted in the New York Times. So, the earthquake happens, all these peacekeepers come to help, including some from Nepal, a country near India where a cholera outbreak was raging. Some people infected with cholera are asymptomatic. These peacekeepers arrive, they set up camp on a river, the latrine they use is faulty. Weeks later, two miles downstream, the first victim of cholera ever recorded in Haiti. And seven days later, downstream where the major city is, a thousand cases, seven days later. Right now in Haiti, there have been 700,000 cases of cholera and over 8,000 deaths. And cholera is there to stay, inadvertently, apparently introduced by people going to help. So, I told you that cholera is also an inhabitant, a natural inhabitant of the environment. So initial sequencing suggested, you know what? Those strains in Haiti look just like the ones in Nepal. That's end of story. Rita Caldwell, who's well known for describing how cholera lives in the environment naturally, she said, hold on a second. It might be that the environmental isolates that we find everywhere, including Haiti, may have shared some DNA with the Nepal strains and contributed to the epidemic. And they sequenced some strains suggesting that horizontal transfer had occurred once that strain arrived. So the CDC was interested in this question as well. Where do outbreaks come from? So they sequenced a whole bunch of isolates, 60 isolates from various locations on the island over different times over the last three years. Their sequencing results from the paper we published together suggest that there is absolutely no horizontal gene transfer had occurred. All of the strains in cholera look remarkably like strains from Haiti. No evidence of DNA exchange. So they got us involved because they asked us, can you guys test whether those strains actually can take up DNA? Because we study horizontal gene transfer. So these are results from that paper with our CDC collaborators. Here's our strain that we use in the lab all the time. With its transformation frequency, we set to one. Takes up DNA pretty well. You know our controls where if you delete either of these, you get no transformance. So they're impaired by at least a thousand fold. Every single isolate from Haiti is impaired for DNA uptake. We think that's interesting. Not only did they not take up DNA, it looks like they couldn't. And so what our interest in this is, among other things, is to use those Haiti strains to identify some novel features or factors in our pathway. Because what I can tell you is Lee Katz has all the genome sequences. And what he told me is that all the components I show you up here, all the ones we know about, are 100% conserved. So those strains from Haiti have one or more mutations or SNPs that prevent them from taking up DNA. We don't know which ones. We're interested in um, identifying factors here in these dotted pathways. And what I can told you, I don't have time to show you, but Erin just this past week did this cool experiment where she took the Haiti strains and she asked, maybe the mutation is up here. And so what she did 
is she overexpressed TFOX from a plasmid in those strains. Right? If the only thing wrong with the Haiti strains was something up here, expressing TFOX should fix them, right? Should rescue those strains. None of them were rescued. And they all quantum sense, we know that. So our interpretation is those Haiti strains have mutations down here. And we're doing sort of genomic comparisons now to identify where those mutations might be and compare them to strains from Nepal and elsewhere. And I want to tell you while we were doing that work, um, another cholera researcher, Melanie Blockish, identified this um, protein called Quister, which is part of this pathway and HAPR regulated. I want to keep that in your head for the last couple minutes of my talk. All right, so here is our model again, remember? That the reason why uh, CITAR can turn this gene on and turn this one off is because to turn this on, it's shutting off a break. The end result is when CITAR is present, we get DNA uptake genes, right? And that was based on the fact that CITAR always shuts things off. So we thought, well, we should be able to find X, right? And in fact, the reviewers of our paper in 2012 said, it's a pity you haven't found X. And we said, yes, I know it's a pity we haven't found X. We're actually looking very hard for X. And I want to illustrate how hard we look and remind you that when we do molecular genetics, we're building bacteria. This takes a long time. So these red bullets here, this is like a year and a half of work of unpublished data. This is the kind of experiments we do. So, you know, uh, secondary screen by Elena. So if X, look at this situation right here. If the reason why competence or this Kamiye luciferase fusion is dark is because X is shutting it off, she should be able to do another transposon mutagenesis, hit X. And all those dark colonies, she should find a rare bright one, right? The first screen was bright to dark, secondary screen dark to bright. She screened 30 or 40,000 again, zero. With Mark Bordowski's help and his student Ronnie Vajan, we had predictions that, remember in E. coli, all of the promoters controlled by this red site R have two strong CRP binding sites separated by 52 to 53 nucleotides, always. So we scanned the genome. We got some interesting candidates that might be X. Everything we did to them, knock them out, make fusions, none of them fulfill X, zero. Then Smith, new grad student in the lab, he thinks, oh, I'll figure out X. So he performs a similar experiment, but instead of selecting for brights, he does a screen, which means if we fuse this promoter, for example, to an antibiotic gene, that strain can't grow on antibiotics. If you get a mutation in X, you should get colonies coming up, right? So you don't just look for darks to become bright, you look for no colonies to colonies. He did that five separate times, nothing. Maybe we're slow learners. So, then Summit joins my lab, and Jacob Thomas, my new postdoc, joins the lab. Summit seems to like to spend my money. So he goes, hey, hey, Brian, why don't we do, I don't know, like an RNA-seq experiment or something like that, right? Okay, so 14 weeks later and five grand later, we get this ginormic data set. This is unpublished data, and I'll show you what we got. So here's an example of the top 30 hits he gets by RNA-seq. This is deep sequencing results. The top 30 genes that look like they're upregulated in a site R mutant. That's why they're all positives. And I've just resorted them for you to see that many of those genes are part of the apparatus. We got the piston, the outer membrane transporter, the Kami A DNA binding protein, all good stuff. And what he also found on that list, in addition to like chitinases, which was cool, was he hits Quister. And then Jacob is churning through his experiments. So he jumped on the bandwagon, too, and said, hey, we're doing RNA-seq. Let's do some chip-seq, right? No problem. Chip-seq, you're looking for a protein, and you're finding all the pieces of DNA it directly binds to. So he does a whole bunch of experiments, um, makes, has antibodies to site R, pulls down all the pieces of DNA that are stuck to site R, and then we sequence them all. He also hits Quister, and I'm only showing you it in this context. He hits Quister as a direct target of site R. Hmm. So, we had all these negative results, and then we have these two pieces of evidence. So how do you like come up, like how does the Crazy Hammer Lab come up with regulatory models where we draw these arrows and stuff? So our current model, which may turn out to be false, you know, we kind of have a history of doing that, but our current model is the following. And it's cool because it's contrary to all the results in E. coli, and we think that actually makes it interesting. 
Our current model is this. And the left is unchanged, meaning CIDAR truly acts as this anti-activator of UDP. It shuts it off. Our results are consistent with E. coli, right? Its job is to land on the DNA, just like I'm showing you here, and shut it off. Our genetics support that. Remember I said it was repressing a repressor was our model, but we can't find X. So our new model is the following, and it's based on Summit and Jacobs results that perhaps for DNA uptake genes, CITAR is actually a positive direct regulator of Quister. So instead of repressing a repressor, it's activating an activator. And the model is as follows. And the cool thing was, in E. coli, in 1996, the big wigs in the E. coli field predicted that such promoters might exist. And they did that by sort of making a, a, a Frankenstein promoter, and they showed that actually Site R can act as a positive regulator in some cases. And they predicted that maybe out there in other bacteria, there are such promoters never been found. And the, the model they proposed was that Site R might actually bind to weak DNA binding sites, and it can't really land there all by itself. It needs Site R interactions to stabilize the interaction and recruit RNA polymerase. And in this way, Site R is acting as a co-activator. Of course, when you delete Site R from those strains, CRP can't land on that promoter, and when you add cytidine, the same. So the consequence to COMI A, notice it's black, gray, gray, is the same as this model. The mechanism, totally different. And so I don't have any more data to show you about that, but that is what we're testing now. And we think that that would be an amazing new result. So here's the pathway we're left with. It's certainly more complex and interesting than I first described. The inner part of this pathway seems to be um, involved in associations of vibrios with the human host, but it's integrated into a network that responds to other signals that are important for cholera out in the environment. So you need, again, chitin, quorum sensing signals, and low nucleosides in the environment. And we're testing whether this is truly repression of a repressor or activation. And I should tell you, I don't have time to show you the data, but Sarah Wilson's an undergrad in my lab, and so her project, for example, is to test this interesting observation that this quorum sensing pathway seems to turn on the apparatus for taking up DNA. At the same time, it shuts off production of these sticky biofilms. And so her thesis work, for example, is to te test whether this is an accident or whether cholera is purposely shutting off production of these sticky substances on its surface to allow it to take up DNA. And then finally, um, Joseph El Sherbini, who's been in my lab for a long time, he's a senior undergrad also, his project with Patrick Bardil in the lab is um, capitalizing on this genetic screen that we did, I didn't show you, that these small RNAs actually have another target. They're in a negative way, regulating this other histidine kinase, which was shown in the literature to also sort of share phosphate with this pathway. And so they're working on that project now, and it suggests that this quorum sensing pathway might have three inputs through that receptor, that receptor, and also this protein. So with that, I should thank the folks in my lab. So Dr. Zhao, who defended, and she's now doing a postdoc at the Rockefeller. Elena Antonova, Dr. Antonova, who's starting a postdoc at Berkeley next week. Summit and Aaron, who took the mantle of that project and are working on it now. Patrick and Jacob, the postdocs in the lab. Joseph and Sarah, whose project I just hinted at at the end. And we have some new students who, again, convinced to join us on this crazy adventure. I want to thank Roger and Taylor for their help, and Mark and Vani. I told you about the engineers we work with. Tim Miyashiro and Jan, they work on Vibrio Fisheri, a similar system. I told you about Chris's contribution to the cyclic IGMPs. Cheryl and Lee's work at the CDC, and that's an ongoing collaboration. Uh, Sina and Sabine are working on the, that new small RNA target I told you about. And Malka Halpern is a collaborator who has given us a lot of environmental isolates to test whether the pathways we study in our domesticated strain are conserved in environmental isolates. And I should thank the NSF for their support and CRDF and NIH for a pilot grant to do some of these studies. And of course, the School of Biology and Georgia Tech. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Julia.
methodology? Yeah. Right. I went through it really fast, of course. So uh, we've gone back now and tested strains from Nepal, first of all, to test whether they can take up DNA. And all the Nepal strains we looked at are defective for DNA uptake. So we think that it arrived in Haiti defective in horizontal gene transfer. So one provocative interpretation of that is that they arrived ill-prepared to adapt to that changing environment because they've lost one of their tools for taking up DNA and sort of ad adapting very quickly. So certainly it might evolve their, in, um, participate in their survival in the environment because even though we always talk about DNA uptake as for taking up pieces of DNA that help you become a better pathogen, it just as easily allows you to take up DNA to utilize other carbon sources and things that might be important in the environment. So one prediction is that they came ill-equipped and they might not fare that well in the environment over the long term in Haiti. And so they're going back and sampling over time. Jim. Do they have any mechanisms for picking up horizontal Absolutely. So I brushed over that. But there's three mechanisms that bacteria use for taking up DNA from the environment. They can take it up. Um, by plasmid, so plasmids, little circles get exchanged via a bridge between a donor and a recipient. That's how a lot of antibiotic resistance genes get acquired by bacteria. The second is by transduction, meaning a phage, a bacterial virus, can land on the cell and dump cargo into the cell. And again, the bacteria now have acquired a piece of foreign DNA. And the third, which we study, is transformation, which I should note was um, described in 1928 by Griffith who observed transformation and called it the transforming principle. I just talked about this in class, right? And in 1942, Avery, McCarty, and McLeod won the Nobel Prize for showing via those experiments that DNA is the molecule of inheritance. So transformation, DNA uptake, is pretty fundamental in terms of molecular biology and understanding of cells. Thanks, Jim. Joel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we we think so. Rosie Redfield is the strong proponent of this eating DNA hypothesis. She's that researcher who called out the arsenic story. She has blue hair and purple hair sometimes. She's pretty provocative. She's in her 60s. And so um, she thinks that bacteria take up DNA when they're starved to eat it because some bacteria like hers will take up DNA willy-nilly from whomever, meaning they'll take up nonspecific DNA, whereas other bacteria only take up their own. They recognize a particular sequence that says, that's my DNA. So the model is that to build that transformation apparatus to take up double-stranded DNA would be rather costly. You've got to build this giant apparatus. You've got to produce these enzymes. If there's free pieces of DNA floating around, there's other transporters that those things passively come through. And so that's much easier when you're starved to eat, you know, bite-sized morsels. Carol. We tried that, yes. So what I showed you then is though the small RNAs have multiple targets. So it turns out in E. coli, too, there might be a single small RNA that has multiple targets. Each one of those interactions has different mismatches. So the idea is that if you optimize a small RNA for one target, it might compromise its ability to work on the other. So it's balanced so that it can regulate a whole bunch of different targets. These are transacting RNAs, which mean the RNA is made from a gene over on this part of the chromosome. And it's regulating genes from all over the place, which is very different than an antisense RNA that's 100%. When we make the mismatches, we remove them and make it perfect, it still works for repressing HAPR. It works poorly now for activating the other target. Yeah. So along those same lines, um, you actually showed in your experiment where you do um, mutation on the RNA and then on the target. Yep. Um, not only does it restore functionality, but it actually appeared to have better functionality. <laughs> So um, as far as applications for engineered um, gene silencing or, or activation, um, you showed that those sequences, those binding sequences, are necessary, absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. ones, but are they sufficient? Could you put that in the 5' UTR of an arbitrary target? Have you guys looked at that? Great question. Independent regulation? That was a cool observation you made. 
this is what you're talking about, way back here. When we make the two, we switch them both, we restore the interaction, but it's better. And we actually see that in our phenotypes, too. We don't understand why that is. Um, but perhaps it has to do with Kittle's observation that these, they're well balanced to sort of regulate all the targets they need to properly. And if you push it one way, you can get better binding maybe here with this mutation, but it might screw up your ability to do the other job. As to how modular they are, there are some examples in other small RNA interactions that you can do that. The only ones you hear about are the ones that get positive results and are published. Believe me, we have tried to do this. It is so much harder than you think. Everyone who does these stories you read in the literature, we sought to find a mutation that disrupted the interaction, and they don't tell you how. You know, Elsa made 30 or 40 or 50 mutants, right, before we found the one that worked. When it works, it's awesome, right? And it does demonstrate that the interaction happens right there. The other ones, we still understand these so poorly why they didn't work. But if you tried to actually attach this 500 TR region that's being recognized on the gene, it's different. Well, we put it to GFP, right? We made that GFP HAPR fusion. But as you narrow that thing down, the sequence around it can matter because you get alternate pairing. Right? The mRNA might fold back on itself in ways that are really difficult to predict computationally. So when it works, it works. When it doesn't, it's hard to tell why. Benjamin. Oh, Eric. Uh, Brian, first of all, certainly tender worthy. Thanks. Um, second of all, so you, you talked about the QRRs, the half R, the SIT R. Is all of this a simultaneously activate the request? Yeah. Is that unique to form sensing pathway, or do metabolic pathways? That's not that? uncommon. So a lot of protein regulators that land on DNA can do both, and it depends. It's kind of like the small RNAs. It depends on where you land. That's really important. So there's a protein, for example, that can land right in the promoter and shut it off, but that same protein can land upstream and recruit polymerase. That's a pretty common theme. And so it's not necessarily obvious. You know, it, it depends on what people have described. Sometimes they describe one of those mechanisms really carefully, and then it turns out it does the other as well. Yeah, it's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. So you also said that um, with the RNA, there's a hairpin structure, there are mismatches there, there are no mismatches, there are gaps. Uh, can, is it so well conserved that you can look at the gene and say, here are all the genes that are regulated by the RNA, or do those Great gaps question. Actually? So another year and a half of work, actually like eight years of work, we're done trying to do that. So there are, there are algorithms to predict targets of small RNAs. And back in Bonnie's lab, I did this. And this, these are rotation projects, which is you use these computational methods. They predict the pairing, but the mismatches make it really tough. So you get a whole list of targets. You have undergraduates make fusions to those and see if they're regulated. Nope. So then we try a different, slightly different tweak on the algorithm. We send them in again. We get a new list. Nope. We did this like four times. And finally, the truth is those algorithms are notoriously um, poor. And one of the reasons is there's an algorithm target RNA that was developed in Susan Gottesman's lab. It does a really good job of predicting the pairing. What it doesn't do a good job, as Roger knows, is predicting whether HFQ binds to the target. And you need that chaperone. And how HFQ binds to DNA is poorly understood. So they can't put that into the algorithm. And Susan showed computer algorithm says these two should interact. We don't see it. If they engineer in a fairly good HFQ binding site, 